It is Friday, October the 26th, and this is The Drill. And thank you very much. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. So um, in you're going to find that uh, the way to defeat, again, socialism is at the so-called retail level. That means personally, uh, one-on-one. I have to I have to defeat the liberals in my life. The liberals are socialists, and you have to defeat the ones in your life. And if we all are doing that, then uh, we take away the support, the political support that socialism now enjoys, the cultural and political support. And we will find that there will be fewer and perhaps no such thing as uh, human caravans on their way to the United States uh, to agitate for a socialist revolution. Uh, that there will not be people that are going to be uh, sending bombs, real, fake, or otherwise, to uh, political uh, figures um, in this country. And uh, so uh, one of the ways that you can do that is realize that the left is always bluffing. An example of that is that there's a, a man that I know that I speak with on a fairly regular basis. And so he asked me a question one day, and I recognized it immediately as a kind of a foundational question. In other words, after you answer uh, that question, then he's going to come up with his main point. And uh, it's sort of like a trap. But anyways, the question was, uh, so which party of the Democrats or the Republicans is the party of the rich? So I told him, well, it's the Democrats, of course. Now, at this particular point, if he was acting in good faith, and this was a truly intellectual exercise, he would have either uh, asked me for an explanation Oh, really? How do you figure? Right. Or he would have contradicted me and provided um, some evidence and proof. He would have said, excuse me, uh, Ron, but uh, that's not true. The fact of the matter is Republicans are the party of the rich. And this is why. Okay, then he's acting in good faith. He is um, attempting to make an intellectual point. He's attempting to persuade me of something. And I'm not afraid of being persuaded. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I want to learn. I want to know because I don't want to waste my time. So, um, but if he's not acting in good faith, if he's being a socialist, he's using these questions as a weapon, as a source of power, then um, you're not going to be able to... uh, have a a conversation. He's not looking to persuade you. He's looking to manipulate, bully, and intimidate, which was basically the the issue here. But by simply contradicting him, we find out. It's one of the ways you can find out. Another way I could have handled it that would have been equally appropriate would be to say to him, gee, uh, uh, Fred, um, I hadn't thought about it. Which party is the party of the rich and why? And again, then you're going to smoke him out and find out, uh, is this guy, uh, he, is he going to be, is he, is he acting in good faith or not? So in any case, instead of doing that, instead of coming out and saying, gee, Ron, you're wrong, and this is why you're wrong, or asking me for an explanation, he rephrased the question. He stops and, and pauses for a second because it was obviously not something he expected. And then he says, no, 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 let's try that again. Which party is the party of the rich? And uh, I, I held my, I st- stood my ground. I said, I'm going to tell you again. It's the Democrats. The Democrats are filthy rich. Nancy Pelosi is filthy rich. Chuck Schumer, uh, Maxine Waters, all these lying scumbags that uh, claim to be interested in the poor and worried about the poor. And they're uh, as rich as the day is long. And I mean multimillionaires worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, in some cases, um, like with Maxine Waters, where she's been able to use her position as a uh, congressperson uh, to help her husband, uh, her husband's business kind of thing. So it's kind of uh, mm, may not exactly be illegal or corrupt, but uh, she's not acting in the best interests of her constituents there for sure. 
So, um, and it's true with uh, many Democrats, uh, Kennedys were the same way, filthy rich, and uh, yet pretend to be concerned about the poor. And um, I think the only people in this country that are truly concerned about the poor are the people that are poor, or actually, better put, are the people that are broke. Because really what you have in this country are people that are broke and people that are flush. Because in this country, you can go either way. You could be, you could have millions of dollars today, and you could be broke tomorrow. It happened to many uh, Bernie Madoff victims uh, that uh, took their their entire fortune, gave it to Mr. Madoff uh, to invest uh, with the uh, understanding that they were going to get a 10% uh, per year uh, return on investment and ended up losing everything. They were paupers overnight. They were broke. So, and that's, you know, because this is not a, um, a caste system where no matter what, you know, uh, because you're going to usually in a caste system, if you, I guess if you go broke, the government just gives you more money, you know, because you have to maintain your maintain appearances or whatever, if you're, uh, uh, a Duke or a Prince or something of that nature. But anyways, um, yeah, so those are the people, one of the questions you're, one of the things you're going to get is questions like that, where, uh, people are, uh, on the left in your, um, social circle, whether it's your family or your, uh, coworkers that are going to try and trap you with questions like that. And one of the first things you want to do is smoke them out, find out, are they, uh, acting in good faith? And one of the best ways to do it is simply to give them, uh, a contradiction, con- you know, which is the party of the, of the rich, I knew what answer he was looking for. I know what he wanted to hear, but I'm not going to give it to him. First of all, because it's just simply not true. And uh, second of all, because uh, I'm not going to allow him to use words as weapons. And you shouldn't either. So, And remember, if you don't want to contradict somebody, let's say it's a boss, because maybe it's your boss or something, then you can always use the uh, kinder, gentler Uh, way of putting it and that is to simply say gee you know i really hadn't thought about it okay somebody says what do you think about this caravan coming up from uh guatemala one of the best answers is you know i hadn't thought about it because more than likely you haven't more than likely they're surprising you with this question okay so you can honestly say you know i hadn't thought about it or you can say i hadn't thought about it recently what should i think and you'll find out right away whether or not this is a person that's acting in good faith, that is um, interested in getting some information, that's really, that I'm just confused, I'm really not sure what I want to think about this, or if they're a socialist and they're looking to steer you in a particular direction. So so today uh, we're, I'm going to be um, reading Ayn Rand, the Ayn Rand uh, lexicon, a concept from the Ayn Rand lexicon, and... Then after that, I'm going to be reading from the Playboy um, interviews, and this one is going to be the interview with uh, Bill O'Reilly. And then uh, lastly, I'm going to uh, play a uh, some of the recording of Sean Hannity's show, and uh, we'll see what he has to say and uh, make some comments. All that when I get back. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome back. And um, so the Ayn Rand lexicon is all about concepts. Okay, it, You may think it's it's all about words and definitions of words. Eh. It's really about, when you get right down to it, it's about concepts, because that is so important, because the left likes to play materialist games. They like to pretend that words are just arbitrary. Okay, that uh, whatever they mean, whatever the majority wants them to mean at any given moment. No, they don't. They represent um, concepts. Okay, words are arbitrary, sensible signs with meanings imposed on them by the convention, but concepts are not. And today's concept of the day is the word concept. 
A concept is a mental integration of two or more units which are isolated by a process of abstraction and united by a specific definition. By organizing his perceptual material into concepts and his concepts into wider and still wider concepts, man is able to grasp and retain, to identify, identify and integrate an unlimited amount of knowledge, a knowledge extending beyond the immediate concretes of an any, any given immediate moment. In any given moment, concepts enable man to hold the focus of his conscious awareness much more than his purely perceptual capacity would permit. The range of man's perceptual awareness, the number of percepts he can deal with at any one time, is limited. He may be able to visualize four or five units, as for instance five trees. He cannot visualize a hundred trees or a distance of ten light years. It is only his conceptual faculty that makes it possible for him to deal with knowledge of that kind. Man retains his concepts by means of language. With the exception of proper names, every word we use is a concept that stands for an unlimited number of concretes of a certain kind. And I want to interject here. It has been said that anything, any word ending in I-T-Y is considered an abstraction. Everything else can, is considered a concept. So reality is an abstraction. Certainty is an abstraction. Um, morality is a, an abstraction. And beauty, those are all abs, abstractions as opposed to con, uh, concepts. A concept is like a mathematical series of specifically defined units going off in both directions, open at both ends, and including all units of that particular kind. For instance, the concept man includes all men who live at present, who have ever lived, or will ever lived. A number of men so great that one would not be able to perceive them all visually, let alone to study them or discover anything about them. To what precisely do we refer when we designate it three persons as men? We refer to the fact that they are living beings who possess the same characteristic distinguishing them from all other living species. A rational faculty, through the specific measurements of their distinguishing characteristics, qua men, as well as all of their other characteristics, qua living beings, are different. As living beings of a certain kind, they possess innumerable characteristics in common, the same shape, the same range of size, same facial features, same vital organs, the same fingerprints, etc. And all of these characteristics differ only in their measurements. So it goes on, <clears throat> but that's all I'm going to, it goes on for several pages, but that's as much as I'm going to um, go ahead and cover uh, for today. So and it is absolutely essential that you remember that words um, have uh, are are here to represent certain concepts. What is it that makes a dog a dog and not a cat? And that's what you're getting at with concepts is essences. You get down to the essences, and it's vitally important that you understand essences versus a defining things and people and situations by non essentials by their shape by their size by their quantity by their quality there's a there's a whole list of things that are um, non-essential uh, descriptions and so uh, and that makes a difference in terms of being able to understand because you're going to get a lot of crap from the left and they're going to try to bamboozle you they're going to try to get you confused and demoralize you psychologically demoralize you and this is one of the ways they do it with materialism by pretending that all, that all words are interchangeable they can mean whatever we want them to mean whenever we want them to mean it therefore words are really an issue of power not an issue of intellect and that is absolutely incorrect wrong 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 okay when i come back um it's going to be a little bit of Bill O'Reilly. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome back. Uh, Playboy interviewed Bill Bill O'Reilly uh, some 10, 20 years ago. And uh, in his uh, interview, it's one of the most interesting things about it is that he's confused 
Um, we well, the left likes to, particularly where it comes to um, Republicans, claim that there is such thing as a moderates, and that um, there are moderate Republicans. And so Bill O'Reilly, I'm sure, likes to fashion himself as being a moderate Republican or even a moderate conservative. Uh, in reality, there is no such thing. Um, there is when you're coming to definitions, everything is either a or non a. That's um, Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. And uh, you ask yourself, what is the moderate position on abortion? What is the moderate position on any issue? What is the moderate position on change? There is no such thing. It doesn't exist. What it really is, is people that are moderate are confused. They hold conflicting views, but still call themselves a conservative or a Republican. So they'll, they might be pro-choice on abortion, but... Um, don't they don't like the the EPA they don't like they but they fall into line uh, on all the other issues with Republicans and conservatives that kind of thing and they're not moderate they're just confused okay they need to pick and choose they need to decide are you left or are you right and then get your mind right um, accordingly so uh, Playboy what would you do about the enormous numbers of poor and homeless in this country? O'Reilly, 90% of the homeless and all the social problems come back to addiction and mental illness. Isolate and treat. Playboy, explain your view on gun control. O'Reilly, like with abortion, you can't even talk about gun control without people running around the house with their arms up in the air doing the samba because they feel so threatened. I agree that we have a constitutional right to bear arms. It's against the Constitution to ban handguns. However, there is absolutely no excuse for any human being on the face of the earth to use a firearm in the commission of a crime. We should have mandatory federal sentencing for all crimes committed with a gun. So uh, real quick, I wanted to uh, uh, jump in. Notice the question. Notice the question. And O'Reilly let it slide. Okay. Uh, stupid O'Reilly, let it slide. Playboy, explain your view on gun control. It's a loaded question. He doesn't say explain your view on the Second Amendment to the Constitution. Explain your view on the right of the individual to uh, bear arms. Okay? He says, what is your view on gun control? So i got to remember that one. But anyways, um, it's like abortion. Not life. Hey, what's your, what's your view on life? What's your view on promiscuity? No. What's your view on abortion? So again, they slanting the question so that it, it has a tendency to uh, give the left an edge. And uh, Bill O'Reilly, being a smart man, he should have seen that and he should have stopped him immediately and said, excuse me, excuse me, you mean what's my position on the Second Amendment of the Constitution? I support it, of course. Okay, so then in his answer, he says, um, what is he saying? Uh, rah, 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 I agree we have a Constitution. I agree that we have a constitutional right to bear arms. Gee, how magnanimous of you, King Bill O'Reilly. You agree, you agree, fabulous, who cares? It's like if I tell you 2 plus 2 equals 4, and you say, I agree, so what? The question is whether you agree. The question is, are you right or wrong? Two plus two equals four. You're right, Ron. Okay. There is a Second Amendment to the Constitution that guarantees the individual the right to bear arms. Yes, you're right. Not I agree. Because, I, again, we I agree gets leans towards uh, subjectivistic um, thinking. Playboy, does the right to bear arms include AK-47s? O'Reilly, no. The state has a right to ban certain weaponry as unnecessary. You don't have the right to have a bazooka in your house. It's a public safety hazard. You can't have it, and if you don't like it, tough. Okay, wrong. Simply wrong. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that uh, says you can't have a bazooka, or you can't have... It says the right to bear arms. That's what it means. Now, you know, I go out and I buy a bazooka, and uh, I go home, I bring my bazooka home, uh, I don't know, first of all, I don't know where you're going to, other than hanging it on the wall, uh, I don't know where you're going to fire a bazooka. I don't know any gun ranges that will uh, allow you to fire a bazooka. Maybe you can go out on somebody's property that has a ranch out in Arizona or Texas or something. But I go home, and uh, my neighbors, I tell my neighbors, hey, hey, I just bought a bazooka. Right? 
Well, the neighbors then may decide that they've got issue with that. It may end up being a civil issue. And I think that's where uh, where it should remain is as a civil issue. Neighbor does who wants to live next door to somebody that has a bazooka? You know, and I'm not necessarily going to run out and sell my house just so I can get away from Mr. Bazooka. So I uh, may fee- may have a claim. And again, if they're going to make laws against guns or weapons, then do it on the civil side. You know, and it's it's ridiculous, anyways. What does anybody want with a bazooka? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, uh, but anyways, he's wrong on that one. So, uh, Playboy, Roger Ailes said that you are opposed to capital, capital punishment because it's not cruel and unusual enough. Is that a valid statement? Uh, O'Reilly, it's hyperbole. I'm against capital punishment because I don't believe it deters the crime that it's punishing. Also, I don't believe society should come down to the level of killers. And which is worse, keeping someone in solitary confinement for the rest of his life or putting a needle in his arm when he's already anesthetic and he's out in two minutes? I know which I'd take. Tim McVeigh was begging for the needle. And uh, again, he misses the point here, wrong again, um, uh, Mr. O'Reilly is, in that it's not necessarily designed to deter. That might be one of the um, qualities of the, the capital punishment um, that uh, it may may or may not happen. If it does, that's a bonus. The issue, the essence, is justice. Are there some crimes for which people should be put to death? And I believe that there is. And that's why we put people, part of, actually the whole reason we're putting people in jail is, and and having a justice system is because otherwise you and I take matters into our own hands. Okay? And we may end up with somebody deciding that uh, uh, to have the death penalty for parking violations. We don't want that. We don't want vendettas. We don't want feuds. We don't want vigilantes. We don't want uh, lynchings. We don't want that. So we turn it over to uh, the state to have a justice system. But what we're, we go to the state, we say, okay, fine, we'll let you solve the problems that me and my neighbor are having, or have an issue, but there's got to be justice. I've got to be, as a victim, satisfied that justice was done here. Okay, and saying that, because um, you can also put, uh, he says, which would you rather have, a needle in your arm or be in solitary confinement? Let's look at it from the victim's standpoint. Uh, which would you rather have, that the uh, the killer is uh, dead, which means that they not never, ever get out on parole, and uh, so you don't have to worry about that, and uh, you also don't have to worry about uh, having to pay for his incarceration for the rest of his life. Okay? now, And then the or part of it is, again, like I said, solitary confinement or uh, putting him in... Uh, uh, putting him, leaving him in jail for the rest of his life. You're having to pay for his medical care. You're having to pay for his um, food and lodging and God knows what else. Because now prisoners are able to get um, sex reassignment surgery uh, and have uh, things like that. And we have to pay for that kind of thing. And if the uh, has a, he has a heart disease, then the patients have a right to uh, be uh, seen promptly and uh, get surgery and get and without having to pay for it. So if there's a bypass that's necessary, uh, the courts have ruled that they, they get it. They get a bypass and the, and the, um, uh, the uh, taxpayers have to pick up the tab. So if you're a victim, do you want that prospect hanging over your head is that uh, we're paying this guy and he's not productive. It's not like he's working and he hasn't he hasn't been rehabilitated. He hasn't, you know, truly, um, he hasn't changed himself in any way, shape, or form. We're just paying this guy to, um, uh, paying for, at least for his room and board. And he may decide he wants to go out and get a degree. Who's going to pick up the tab for that? Very possibly the, the victim 
in terms of uh, their uh, paying their taxes and whatnot. So uh, O'Reilly's wrong because he's looking at it from the wrong uh, point of view. Uh, Playboy, you've criticized the war on drugs. What's your objection to it? O'Reilly, in its current form, it's a joke. Drugs are a health problem. If you're caught with drugs in your bloodstream when you do a crime, the judge should order you into mandatory coerced drug rehab. They're doing it in 10 states. And not for 30 days, which doesn't work. It's got to be a year. Not only do you have to wean people off drugs, you have to teach them how to read. You have to give them psychiatric help, teach them life skills. Uh, if you come back again, it's two years. If you come back a third time, it's three years. Um, well, again, that's all fine and dandy, but how do you justify a lot of this in terms of the the um, Constitution? I mean, right on his face, it sounds as though it's unconstitutional. And argue what he's arguing about, it seems to me, also is not um, having a war on drugs, but he's what he objects to is the way it's being fought, that he would, uh, he would do things a little bit differently. Um, see, mandatory rehab, you should be... And he's right about one thing here, where he's saying 30 days isn't going to cut it. That's true. It gets you clean, but you have to follow up as a drug addict or an alcoholic and go to uh, Narconon or AA meetings. And um, then after about a year or two worth of being clean and sober, then your sobriety is on a much better footing than, of course, after 30 days when you're uh, still shaky. But also the problem is w with the, all of this about uh, psychiatric help and teaching them to read and life skills and whatnot, who's paying for this? Is it going to be paid for by insurance companies, or is he expecting the taxpayers to pick up the tab? And what's the morality of that? Uh, the only reason that would work is if uh, you buy into the um, intellectual mistake of the century called determinism, which states that people have no free will, that they do what they do because they're forced to by powers beyond their control. That um, true enough that uh, addicts, are going to are driven by their addiction, but it is they who use their free will to become an addict in the first place. There's also a moral concept that says it is immoral to shield people from the consequences of their actions. Uh, so if you're going to go out and get hooked on drugs, uh, you are the one that bears uh, the responsibility. Uh, you may end up overdosing and more than likely will end up overdosing, and that's on you, not on me or the, or the rest of society. I always kind of figured that the, um, the war on drugs was... Uh, one of the, the worst thing about the war on drugs to me was is the forfeiture of property. This whole idea, notion that property has no rights, and that if, you're, if you appear to be suspicious, you carry a lot of cash with you, and... Uh, the uh, authorities happen to, uh, let's say you're, I've heard of, heard of it in small planes, for instance. The guy's got a small plane, he's got cash, because he's going somewhere to buy something. But the authorities say, I don't know, it seems suspicious to me. You got a plane, it's full of cash, I think maybe you're a drug uh, runner. So they seize the plane, seize the cash, and it becomes up to you to prove a negative. Prove that you're not a drug dealer, prove that the money is not from drug sales, which is impossible to do. That's the worst thing about uh, the, uh, the war on drugs. Uh, let's see. Playboy, would you legalize or decriminalize marijuana? O'Reilly, I decriminalize it, but if you leave your house and you're stoned, I'm going to find the hell out of you and use the money for rehab. If you want to smoke pot in your house and be an idiot in front of your kids, go ahead. Well, um... I don't know. I think, uh, <clears throat> again, he's confused. He's trying to have it both ways, trying to find some kind of a mythical middle ground here. Yes, it'll be legal, but only if you smoke it indoors. But if you go outdoors and you're stoned, then you're subject to arrest. Uh, ridiculous. I can drink inside my house. I can drink outside my house. I can have a drink or two and go out. Uh, uh, walk down the street if I want to. So long as I'm not drunk in public, drunk in public, I'm okay. And the same thing should be with marijuana. You smoke, uh, maybe you have 
a, a little bit of marijuana, but you're not stoned out of your gourd um, and uh, creating a problem, creating a situation where you cannot care for yourself or others. Then who cares where you smoke it, whether it's in your backyard or in your house or anywhere else. So again, he's wrong about that. So we're going to go ahead and leave that here for the moment. And when we come back, um, a little bit of Sean Hannity. Thank you. Welcome back. And now we're going to uh, be listening to a little bit of uh, the Sean Hannity show. I believe this is from yesterday, uh, but um, we will find out in a second here. Here we go. All right. Glad you're with us. Wow. What a day we've got. 12 days till Election Day. The most important midterm. Well, we'll have in our life. We'll survive anything that happens. I don't want people to get that panicked, that freaked out. But the bottom line is now is the time. A lot of states now have early voting. Why not get it out of the way? I'll tell you the races that matter in the Senate the most. The most state I'm worried about the most right now is Florida with Rick Scott for the Senate and and Ron DeSantis for the governorship. I will we'll get into more details about the danger to the people of Florida if Gillum is ever elected governor of that state. Uh, Marsha Blackburn will check in with us today. She, of course, running against, well, now the exposed phony fraud Schumer wannabe uh, Bredesen in that important state of Tennessee. Republicans have to win that state. It is critical to advancing the president's agenda. Um, I have uh, polls are looking better now in since the exposure of of uh, what's her name? Claire McCaskill in Missouri. I know it's always tight in Nevada, but that race with Dean Heller is so, so very, very important that that seat be held. Uh, I'm feeling a lot better considering that Martha McSally, 28 year veteran, war hero, six deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, and she's going up against a radical leftist, uh, anti war protester, Kristen Cinema, who had no problem with Americans joining the Taliban, none at all, and thinks that people in her state, in other words, the voters, are crazy, and that her state is the meth capital of democracy among other radical friends she has that she's invited to Arizona State University. Uh, John Tester still has a lead in Montana, but I can see that lead evaporating over time. He's just basically a reliable Schumer vote every single time. That doesn't represent the values of the people of Montana. Heidi Heitkamp, her campaign is collapsing, thankfully. Worried a little bit. Indiana's a state that should be won, and Joe Donnelly should be defeated, and Braun is a great candidate, would make a great senator. The only problem in Indiana right now is you've got a lib libertarian siphoning off the votes of Braun, who would otherwise be easily defeating Donnelly. And don't forget, that's often set up on purpose by people. I'm not saying in this case, but, you know, I, I, I understand some libertarians. They hate this argument. But the reality is if you split your vote and you vote, it's a half a vote for Donnelly. And I don't think any libertarian wants Donnelly to continue because he's basically the Chuck Schumer Donnelly of Indiana. He doesn't represent Indiana values. Um, and I think the president going there is going to help, uh, hopefully, Braun in Indiana. Uh, and we'll be watching and waiting the whole time. You know, look, the, let me tell you what the worst news is. In the You know, we've been watching all of this happen. You know, all of this incivility that we've been monitoring, and the silence has been deafening. It's just been especially deafening from Democrats and the news media. They've been unwilling to criticize things they obviously should criticize. And it's been going on two years. This, this is not a new phenomenon. It takes on different forms. It all started with Madonna. I want to, I dream an awful lot about blowing up the White House and deteriorated from there, and De Niro wanting to punch the president in the face, and Joe Biden wanting to punch the president and take him behind the schoolyard and, and fight it out and duke it out. You know, this is the Democratic Party. Hillary, you can't be civil. Eric Holder, kick him. We watch what's happened to Pam Bondi, Secretary Nielsen, Sarah Sanders and her kids, Ted Cruz and his wife, Mitch McConnell and his wife, multiple times, Boulder's now being thrown through the office window of Kevin McCarthy, the House Majority Leader. 
I mean, and there's been virtual silence. Now we have this terrible incident that we have been watching where, you know, these suspected mail bombs, you know, thank God of the 10 that have been sent, uh, they haven't even confirmed fully that they're real bombs. I assume that they are. Thank God none of them went off being sent to several prominent Democrats around the country. We do have one instance where a Republican is being threatened. We did have the, t- the two instances in Minnesota where two Republican candidates were punched. One guy got cold cocked from the, behind at a concussion that's going to keep him out of commission for six weeks. You know, we're living in times where the hypocrisy reeks. The media, Democrats, they only care about Russia collusion if Russia collusion involves Donald Trump, which it does not. But then when they see all the evidence emerging that Hillary bought and paid for Russian lies by funneling money to from a law firm to a op research group that then hires a foreign national that makes that won't even stand by, you know, his ridiculous stories of hookers urinating in beds in Moscow and Donald Trump years ago. In under oath, he says, I can't confirm any of this. It's just, you know, well, it's 50-50. Um, it's raw intelligence. What do I know? And then that still becomes the basis to commit a fraud on a FISA court. And then it still becomes the basis of, you know, these rogue upper echelon, not rank and file, big difference. You know, the Strucks, the Pages, the McCabes, the Comeys of the world, et cetera, you know, all writing Hillary's exoneration, she should have been put in jail or tried, but then she gets to continue. Then she spends the money on the Russian dossier. And then when they can't beat Trump, even by disseminating those lies to you, we, the people, well, then they go the next step, their insurance policy, which is even though Lisa Page said there was no evidence of Trump-Russia collusion and Strzok said that there's no there there. Well, then they start a media leak strategy, leaking again the same Clinton Russian dossier, and that becomes the basis of the appointment of Robert Mueller. And then we go off investigate. Okay, that's uh, that's good enough for right now. So, um, a couple of things about Hannity. First of all, he's got uh, he's got a pretty good voice, not as good as uh, Rush Limbaugh or or uh, Glenn Beck, but. Uh, better than uh, Mark Levin. Much everybody's better than Mark Levin. That's uh, one guy that should not be on the radio and only got his job because he knew of who he knew. In this particular case, uh, Sean Hannity. So uh, the other thing with uh, Sean Hannity is he is one of the uh, people that he gets so wrapped around the axle. Uh, he is one of the people that's constantly saying that the world is on fire and that he over uh, gets hyperbole in terms of uh, how he assesses the country. Oh, we're on the verge of revolution. You're likely to hear those kinds of statements uh, from uh, Sean Hannity. And uh, they're simply not true. He's, he's a guy that spends way, way too much time absorbed in and with uh, Washington, D.C. And again, if he would spend more time getting out and getting around, he would find out that there there's no revolution happening. There's no civil war shaping up. If he got out and uh, get around, he'd see that people are relaxed, they're friendly, they're polite, uh, they're kind to each other. Yes, we have isolated incidences in which uh, uh, somebody gets uh, cold cocked uh, or uh, whatnot. But uh, by and large, uh, again, people are friendly, they're relaxed, nobody is out looking uh, for trouble. I compare uh, the way people are today to when I went to junior high school, and that was after uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated, Robert F. Kennedy had been assassinated, and um, so it was weird because we I'd gone to school and uh, before a year or yeah, so let's say the year before, and um, you know you're talking to your friends about sports and this, that, and the other thing, and uh, you know just normal stuff. You go to junior high school the next year, and all of a sudden, everybody's got a chip on their shoulder. Everybody's got an attitude. You look at somebody, and it's an excuse to challenge you to a fight. I was walking upstairs. A guy uh, is coming downstairs. It's crowded. You got a lot of students. It's between classes, and students coming down the stairs. And he's got a jacket that's on his uh, coat, or a jacket that's resting on his shoulder, not both shoulders, just the one shoulder as he's coming by me. And uh, we happen to um, 
I don't think I even bumped into him. It was just, I think, bumped into the jacket. The jacket comes off his shoulder, hits the ground, and he had a fit. He threw a temper tantrum. Oh, 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 oh. He just went on and on about it. And so it was always that. Uh, that in, and I had no idea what the hell was going on until years later when I put it together and realized that a lot of this was uh, because of the... Um, politics of the time were, well, what was going on sociopolitically, again, uh, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, some other things. I think the Watts riots had occurred uh, right around this time. So um, that was a t- period of time where, again, every, uh, you had to always be on alert every time you went to school. You got to keep your eyes down. You can't make eye contact with people because, again, you, the, the odds were 50-50 that whoever you made eye contact with was going to say, what are you looking at? You're going to get one of those responses. Today, you walk, I'm out and about all over the place. No such kinds of things are happening. No tension, no chips on people's shoulders. People are relaxed and, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, relatively happy. So, again, if Sean Hannity would get out more, spend less time wrapped around the axle, Uh, He would figure that out. Also, because he's wrapped around the axle all the time, his show has a tendency to be very negative. Always on about what the socialists or the left is doing, what they said, what they do, what they think, and not enough time spent (coughs) on what's going right. The economy is is going great gangbusters. You wouldn't know it listening to Sean Hannity. There's all kinds of things that... um, uh, credit that the Trump administration deserves, and uh, plenty of things uh, worth mentioning that don't have anything to do with politics at all, but that are uplifting. But again, you wouldn't know any of those things existed at all if you listened to Sean Hannity. So that's one of the areas where he could uh, make some uh, distinct improvements. The other thing I was going to say is that uh, he has a tendency to get sidetracked easily. He'll start a statement, he'll get sidetracked, He'll get sidetracked from his sidetrack. He'll get sidetracked from his sidetrack from his sidetrack. And you're th- and it's just torturous to listen to. And you're waiting for him to get back to his original point. And uh, sometimes it takes quite a while before he does. And every once in a while, he never gets back to it. And it's very difficult to listen to. So, But uh, with that, uh, we come to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, I thank you for listening and have a great day.